uh, Anton, where are we? Uh, we're in Singapore. This is where I live. And uh, what are we doing? Uh, well, I'm working on the Institute in Singapore at the moment. But uh, we said we wanted to do another interview, right? Sure. So, uh, yeah, schedule's pretty hectic. So can't really do one in the traditional sense. But uh, I thought it would actually be better if you flew in from London and uh, come with me on my business trip to New York and London. We're going to be doing seminars there. And then I've got to head on to Ibiza, uh, Italy, Caribbean to do mentoring programs. And uh, if you follow me along the way, uh, you'll get a really good insight into what the Institute does, what I do on a regular basis, and uh, I can just drop you off in London on the way. Sound good? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. This is where the journey begins, Ritz Carlton, Singapore. Then we're heading out to New York. Before we travel, I think we should be uh, freshening up. We want to go on the road looking good. So uh, I think we should get a wet shave, get a nice haircut and uh, get on the road feeling good about ourselves when we go to New York. How's things? Not too bad. Cool. Oh, classic wet shave and haircut. Proper barber haircut from a Mongolian living in Singapore who's learnt his craft and knows it inside out. See, this is the attention to detail you need. This guy would make a good trader. Thoroughly recommend this. Every man has to go for a wet shave. Looking good, my man. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Yeah. All set. Brilliant. I'll see you next time. Yeah. See you next time. Okay. Take care. Bye now. Yeah, it's important to do these things if you're uh, doing a lot of business traveling, not only for yourself, but for other people around you as well. Feel like a million dollars. Really good. Thank you. Cheers. Why Singapore? Uh, what could I say? Well, why wouldn't you be here? It's, uh, the, it's the gateway to Asia, gateway to Southeast Asia, where everybody internationally comes to do business because it's the easiest place to do business in the world. Secondly, you're surrounded by numerous countries that have got the best demographics in the world and the highest growth. And third, it's got the highest standard of living in the world. Why would you not be here? It's crazy. So Anton, what are you working on? Um, so I'm just going through a whole bunch of messages that we've got through the Institute website. And um, we get scores of these messages every day, actually. And uh, it's all from guys really just asking, you know, for uh, help in learning how to trade. And um, I think this is one of the reasons, actually, why the Institute does so well. Uh, it's because we've really only got two types of students. The first type of student is really um, the older guys 
who have been around the block many times and they've learned from a lot of people in the financial markets with conflict of interest, lost a lot of money, so they have to come to us. They always end up coming to us because we do things properly. And the other guys are really students who are coming out of university and they want to go into the profession. They want to go and work for an investment bank or a hedge fund, become a professional trader. What they don't realize is, is that they can't just walk into these places. They have to actually learn how to do things properly and learn how to trade before they actually look to turn this into a profession. But um, what's quite interesting is that whether it's the older guy or the younger guy, there's generally a common thread throughout all the messages that we get through the Institute. We, uh, <coughs> we've noticed over the last couple of years that there's actually a wider issue at play here that um, you know, really, the older guy uh, is just the, what the younger guy is going to become because they make all the wrong decisions. They make all the wrong financial decisions. They make all the wrong career decisions. And uh, the younger guy is really what the older guy used to be. And when you think about what's going on in the Western world right now with, say, average salaries, good example, uh, the United States, $68,000. Uh, UK, 28,000 pounds, Europe, 26,000 euros. These are all national average salaries. And really, these are just numbers that allow people to live on a month-to-month -month basis. And people are trapped and frustrated. And they're looking at ways out. And trading is just one of those things uh, that people latch onto as a way out. They think it's going to be the answer to getting them out of the problems that they're in. And um, this is actually the wider issue. The wider issue is that there's actually just a million ways to make a million dollars. You know, trading's just one of them. And it's not necessarily just one answer to all your problems. The answer is to sort all your problems out. And that this is why we get so many messages. Think about other problems in the Western world. You know, 50% divorce rate sure. across the Western world. and what you've got is an entire generation of kids who are now going into the workforce and they've had no example of how to do things properly, how to make the right decisions in life. So, you know, I think I know what I'm talking about when it comes to stuff like this because I started with nothing. Uh, I came from a fatherless household and I had to learn everything myself from a very young age, you know, from the age of 16 in double quick time. So, you know, we're going on this business trip um, and if you follow me and if people actually just follow the Institute, I think you're going to pick up a hell of a lot of uh, useful insights into how to actually uh, become generally quite successful uh, and get a lot of answers to these questions that, pe that you might have. So you can follow me and just ask me any question along the way when we go to New, Lo New York when we go to London and give seminars, and um, we meet all these people. So ask me all of these questions. I'll be happy to you know, give as much advice as I can. Cheers, thank you very much. Let's go. Uh, so Anton, I notice uh, it's so it's just you here. Yeah, it's um, it's absolutely necessary. You can't get a lot done in the financial markets if uh, you've got an office full of people bugging you all day, sure. and the phone ringing constantly. It uh, just creates a lot of disturbance. So uh, it's really important to have high levels of concentration, be able to think things through properly and uh, you know, get things done every day and get over the line on things all the time and be able to make well-informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So having like, lots of disturbances in the office uh, just creates an environment where you don't actually get anything done. Mm -hmm. You don't actually make logical and sensible decisions. 
you've just got to have peace and quiet and be able to get all of this stuff done and get it done well. So the way the Institute operates is we've got uh, traders all over the world and they all report in to our back office and we see everything from the back end and we manage everything uh, from the back end, make sure risk is all managed correctly. Um, but also with our own investments, you know, I run all of that from Singapore in a quiet environment. Yeah, Chris, it's uh, Anton here, mate. Um, listen, I need you to pull up my account. Uh, I'm gonna send you uh, an email with um, a whole bunch of orders to uh, execute over the next uh, 24 hours. So I need you to basically reduce exposure by 40% across the board and uh, bring the overall gross exposure of the portfolio down. And uh, in terms of net exposure, I need you to actually uh, hedge, uh, put a 30% hedge on the book. Uh, so I'm going to send you the hedge orders separately on a separate email. Um, and I need to sell uh, Spoos and Dax. So sell five bucks of each and uh, you're going to receive two emails, okay? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Now I've basically got to go to New York on business and London and um, I'll be kind of off the grid for a week or two but I'll be checking in every day. So I'll give you a shout uh, like 9 a.m. EST every morning. Okay, mate. Yeah, I'll send over the emails now. Okay, cheers, bye. I just wanted to discuss uh, dividends after the after earnings season. Yeah, so for the REITs portfolio, Okay, yeah. Okay, so we're nearly done, um, but I just need to call Alan. We've got to sort out uh, the Institute Traders uh, portfolios. Alan, hi mate, how's it going? Yeah, go through all the Institute Traders, top to bottom. Send me the full breakdown. Make sure the exposures are all in line with what needs to be done. Yeah. And if any of the guys are over four or five times, stick them in a separate file. Yeah. So I just want to know where the where the where their unique risk is. So it seems that um, all the things you're catching up on before you go yeah. are all related to risk management. Yeah. Those are the priorities. But it's super important. You know, there's a there's a well-defined process that you go through to actually end up with live positions but once you've got live positions in your portfolios basically there and everything's trading live real time um, it's all about risk management so basically making sure that your downside's protected you know if we're going away for 10 days on the road you obviously can't spend as much time concentrating on that so the right thing to do is reduce overall exposure, reduce your net exposures, and uh, hedge out uh, portfolios to make sure that nothing can hurt you while you're away. We'll still be checking in every day, of course, because we've got over 40 trading accounts at the Institute where we're managing all of these portfolios, so we have to check them. But you know, me going off the grid is basically checking once a day instead of 20 times a day. So what do you enjoy about living in Singapore? Oh, the lifestyle's just awesome. Like today, sun shining just before sunset. You can just walk down to all the five-star hotels, have nice drinks, sunset cocktails every day. It's just phenomenal if you're working in the CBD. Okay, we're at the uh, Fullerton Bay Hotel, Lantern. We're just gonna have some drinks by the pool, watch the sunset. Rich Carlton Hotel. 
Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, it's so good to be back in the aircon. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> so good. We're gonna go for a swim. Yeah. Hey. All right, mate. Hi, mate. How's it going? Kids. A little late night swim. Yeah, I got a lot of work done today, which is always good when you're travelling the next day. And uh, yeah, just trying to get a bit of quiet time. We're going to be uh, after 23, 24 hours door to door tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be landing in New York, and the schedule's going to be really, really busy. So always nice to get a bit of quiet time and uh, the calm before the storm, really. So. Uh, yeah, when we land, we're getting picked up from the airport, straight to Trump Plaza. Uh, we got brokers coming over to the hotel, got to meet up with Raj. Uh, we've got guys flying in at the weekend as well. We've got, we've got to do the seminar in between. And uh, same again in London, the week after. So prepare yourself. It's gonna be a very, very busy schedule. Not a lot of sleep. Every hour is gonna be packed and uh, I think going to get a real insight into what we do at the Institute, what we do on a regular basis, what I do day to day, and I uh, think it'll be interesting and a lot of fun. See you in the morning. See you in the morning. <laughs> generally where I do tend to get quite a lot of work done on flights because it's a place where no one can really disturb me so I can actually get a lot done okay so we've just landed welcome to Germany home of federal backdoor economics and the humble sausage. <laughs> Hello. Good salmon and trout. It's very nice. Yeah. Superb. Cheers. It just gets better and better. I think this is like the tenth course I've had on this flight. <laughs> The 
and Trump. Beautiful place to stay. Overlooking Central Park. Really can't go wrong with any with anything that these guys do. It's the best in town. Uh, Anton, um, do you remember the other day uh, in Singapore? Um, you were talking about what young people do wrong. Um, what do you think? they could do right? Um, it, it comes down to, uh, to a number of things. <clears throat> and they are all connected. Um, but probably one of the most important things, I think, is actually the way people view money. Right. And um, the way, th there's, two, there's two main problems with most people uh, in the way that they view money. The first major problem that I've picked up on over the years is people not really understanding the function of money, sure. why it exists. And if you don't understand why money exists and its real function, you tend to have no respect for it. And the second thing is actually uh, to do with uh, emotion towards money. So having uh, some sort of emotional barrier towards money itself. So, you know, with the first one, for example, like uh, the, for the function of money and the purpose of why it actually exists, you know, we're always uh, told these messages where like, for example, uh, money is the root of all evil, uh, money doesn't make you happy. Uh, the more money you have, the more problems you're going to have. Um, but I just want you to think about it for a second, because it's pretty damn obvious, okay? But people always miss this point. Just imagine a world that didn't have any money in it at all. <laughs> money obviously has a function. And you know, in your own time, you can go and look at this online because uh, it's pretty well known amongst people who understand the function of money. Uh, so <clears throat> look, look up um, the double coincidence of wants. Yeah. The double coincidence of wants is really important to understanding the function of money. Because without money, we essentially live in a barter economy. And everything that we're used to consuming in the world now has come about because of the function of money. And um, it makes society work. It's, it's something that if you, if you understand why it exists to solve the need of the double coincidence of wants, you respect it more right. and people don't get this. So <clears throat> look up uh, the double coincidence of wants and look up the alternatives. So the, 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 uh, the, the barter economy, you know, that's the alternative. And, you know, we're, we're led to believe a lot of the time that wanting money is a bad thing. And people blur the lines between wanting to do better for yourself and your family and that type of greed and the greed of harming or abusing uh, other people mm. and money is the medium through that so, so one in my mind is a positive greed in that you want to do better for yourself and you want to do better for your family in my mind there's nothing wrong with that the other type of greed obviously uh, is not good it's, it's a negative greed mm. where you're harming other people to become wealthy. And you don't have to do that. You know, if you just understand the function of money firstly and respect it, you'll realize that money isn't the root of all evil. It's greed that's the root of all evil in a negative sense when you're harming other people. Sure. Money has a function and there's a positive greed. So 
again, imagine your life or the world without money in it. Everything that you consume, everything that you experience these days is a function of the monetary system that's built up over hundreds of years. Mm. And we've come from the barter economy to be where we are today. Without it, society literally would not function. So understand it and respect it. Mm. That's the first thing. And understand the difference between positive and negative greed mm. and do the right things. And um, what you've also got to understand as well is money itself in enterprise, for example, there's only two inputs to enterprise, capital and labor. And what you've got to understand is that money itself is a commodity. And labor is a commodity as well. And they both have prices. So capital has a price and labor has a price. So for capital, the price is interest. And for labor, it's the price that labor is willing to work for. So there's a labor market. And in any enterprise, there's just two inputs, capital and labor. And capital markets are absolutely necessary. Society would not function without capital markets because capital is a commodity and has a price and it needs to be transacted. And it allocates resources as optimally as possible because there's demand and supply for capital and demand and supply for labor. And when labor wants too much of the share of enterprise and capital gets too less, capital leaves. It goes away. And that's not good for labor long term. So when you understand the function of money and capital markets, you understand that it's absolutely necessary for them to exist because in all circumstances in history, when capital has been locked out of the market and left, there's been widespread depression. Yeah. Money makes society work. And <clears throat> the, a small problem is that, you know, these days it's, a very, it's very popular to have uh, this view of the world, this view of money uh, that the this, this system is broken and doesn't work. Well, it does because there is no better alternative. It's not perfect, but there's no better alternative. And just because, for example, you know, someone was born with no capital doesn't mean the system is wrong or unfair. They just need to understand the role of money and understand its function. So all of these messages that we get about money, so money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. Greed is. Uh, money doesn't make you happy. Well, people that I know and myself um, with money who have done quite well for themselves, we know that. You know, that we're not stupid. You know, these guys aren't stupid. And they, they absolutely know it doesn't make them happy. They're generally speaking exactly the same as they were when they were young and had no money. They're, they're exactly the same type of people, but they're just a little bit older and a little bit wiser. And, you know, the other sayings, so uh, the more money you have, the more problems you have. Well, it's just not the case. The, if the, more, the more money, you only have problems if you don't manage your money properly. So if you manage it well, then you're going you're gonna to do okay. You're, gonna, you're actually probably going to be more comfortable, more relaxed, have more freedom, more choices, and probably help, it helps you become happier. It doesn't make you happy. It just helps you become happier. So all these messages that people get told, you know, constantly growing up, this creates the second problem as well. So first of all, not understanding the function of money, but secondly, also... Uh, ha having emotional barriers to money. It's, uh, it, it's, this is the second problem. And actually, like, I can uh, just go off and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back in a second to illustrate the point. Okay. All right? All right. What do you... What do you I'll, be I'll be back in a second. Wait there. 
I can go and get get something and to illustrate the point more accurately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go back in. Okay. Go back in. I'll show you what I properly mean. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, twenty dollars. <coughs> yeah. What? So it's twenty dollars on the table. Okay. Look at it again. Look at it. Is this is this, uh, is this a magic trick or? <laughs> no, it's not a magic trick. Okay. So. When you look at the $20, yeah. what do you think of it? It's, you could buy me a couple of drinks or a, a meal or a cinema ticket, whatever. It's, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's what it can buy you. Sure. But what do you actually think of it? Well, it's, it's money. It's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So not much. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Now let's move on. What about a hundred dollars? Sure. It's, you know, again, I think about it in terms of what I can buy with it and that's okay. you know, a night out or, you know, going to a nice restaurant, you know, whatever. So yeah, it's like a night out maybe sure. with a few other people, like sure. Sure. go to a nice restaurant, have a few drinks, yeah. take your family out, whatever, right? Well, what do you think of it? Um, I mean, it's a decent amount of money. If I lost it, I'd be a bit annoyed, sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's make let's make the stakes higher. Okay. <laughs> so, here's a thousand dollars. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So it's a thousand dollars. Sure. <clears throat> What do you think of that? Um, so it's become a decent amount of money. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's. What do you? What it's can, quite a lot. What can you buy with a thousand dollars? You could buy I don't know, sort of appliances, you know, things that people typically buy with. A, yeah, phones, TVs, sure, games, consoles, whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. <clears throat> So let's take this to a slightly higher level. Okay. $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's so about right. What do, you, what do you think of the $5,000? Well, it's, I mean, that is a lot of money by any objective standards. That's like, what? It's, uh, somebody's monthly or even salary for two months. Sure. Quite a few people. So what, what do you think of it? Um, again, it's, you know, it's a considerable amount of money for a lot of people. Now I could put any amount of money down on that table. Sure. I could put 10,000, uh, 100,000, a million. Yeah. But let's go back to the beginning. Let's take off the five, the thousand and the hundred and go back to the 20. Sure. And the next question is this. <clears throat> what do you think? the $20 note thinks of you? Nothing, it's just money, it's just a piece of paper. Of course. Right. It can't think. Yeah. It's a piece of paper with 20 written on it. Sure. It's a commodity. It doesn't think. It's a commodity that's used to transact for goods and services to satisfy wants and needs. Mm. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay. The problem with it, with most people, what they don't understand is that all the problems with money exist with them, sure. not with the money. <clears throat> the money doesn't think anything of you. So whether it's $20, $100, $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, $100,000, a million dollars, it doesn't matter. Mm. Because a million dollars or $100,000 or $10,000 is just a whole bunch of 20s that think nothing of you. <laughs> So there's no difference except monetary value. So this is, the, this is the second major problem. It's having emotional barriers because the more money I put down on the table, 
the more you think of it. Sure. Because you think automatically of what it can buy you to satisfy wants and needs. Right. The key is to be indifferent. So going right back to the beginning, understanding the function of money is very important in order to, to respect money. But at the same time, you also have to reduce to zero your emotional barriers and you have to be indifferent. Sure. Now, <clears throat> this brings up an, another interesting point. How can you actually be uh, respectful of money, but at the same time be indifferent? It's kind of sure. contradictory, yeah. okay? But. but in this context, it's not contradictory. Sure. And I'll tell you why. Because respect in this context is simply having awareness. So it's having awareness of what money actually is and being indifferent to money when you look at it, when you see more and more and more of it. And that's the key. So being aware and understanding money, where it comes from. So if you can actually manage to... Uh, understand it properly and understand its function and be aware and be respectful to it but at the same time being different mm. that's the key to actually starting on the road to becoming successful because money will come to you you will respect it but you also know at the same time uh, what it can and can't buy you, but you're indifferent to it as well. Sure. And if that makes sense to you, yeah. then you've got through that barrier. Sure. Anyway, we have a dinner booked at a restaurant, so uh, we should hit the road. I'm quite hungry. Okay, okay. <laughs> So uh, obviously we were out with brokers last night till quite late. Always good to get those things done. Uh, as soon as you get into New York, you know, get those important things out of the way. Uh, and now we've got a seminar. Uh, we've got quite a lot of guys coming down. Uh, Raj is going to be there as well. And uh, I think we need to get our stuff together and uh, get going. <coughs> so I said to them that I was going to top up uh, the margin, the margin on the count. Okay. Um, Right, I think we're good to go. Okay. Uh, we're uh, we're driving to the seminar and stuck in traffic right to the middle of Times Square. West Twenty Third and Six. And uh, we're about to go into the seminar, so we uh, we hire out decent sized rooms because we've got quite a few people coming down. And uh, we have drinks next door afterwards. So, <laughs> so I went to the pub and tossed there for the guy. I told, me, yeah. I told 8, 8 30 we'll be there. He's like, Look, you're the one that ordered 60 years last time? Yeah, it's, uh, it's common sense, you know, wanting to do it. Applying common sense and being consistent. You, know, you don't uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel to be uh, to be successful in the financial markets. It's hard for someone to basically admit that you were wrong. 
by just hold by getting rid of a stock that was a loser. It's it's fine. You know, if you lose if you lose money on a trade, it's fine. It's just yeah. part of the overall game. Now, in a professional trader, the win ratio is closer to 50-50 than you think. But it's how much. It's not like a uh, basketball game. It matters how much you win by. If you become good at trading, mm -hmm. you, it, 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 it overflows and seeps into other areas of your life. You become really good at everything else. I'll see you at the bar. Yeah, I think it was fun. Always enjoy doing a little presentation in New York. I'm trying to make guys great traders. And they're well on their way. People are a bit smarter here. They tend to get it better. It's because they're hustlers. So basically everybody can ask questions at the bar in a more relaxed environment. very well. We had a lot of guys travel to come to the seminar in the US, uh, London and in Asia. We get people flying in from all over the place and these are the guys who are ahead of the game. They're doing the right thing. Yeah, back on Wall Street. Uh, just had a couple of meetings, final day in New York. So got to get a few things tied up and then we're going to head out this evening. Uh, so the other day we were talking about uh, the the stock mistakes exchange, young people make. Yeah. The people make in general, the two ways they kind of mistreat money yeah. and their perception of it. Yeah. What are the other ways people uh, get things wrong? Um, okay, so the other day we talked about uh, the function of money and not understanding the function of money and what it's there for, um, but also talked about the uh, emotional aspects towards money. Uh, the other thing, the other thing that uh, people really get wrong is um, mixing up what an asset is and what a liability is. And if you remember. Uh, the other day when we talked about uh, the function of money, we talked about capital markets and we talked about money being a commodity and uh, money actually having a price. Well, in the debt market, uh, the price of money is interest and uh, in the equity markets, uh, the price is that you're, you're giving away an equity stake in your company and that's whether you're going to the public markets to raise equity capital. Uh, or you're in the private market raising equity capital. Um, but debt and equity is very different. So equity, when you're raising capital uh, and giving equity in return, that's not necessarily a liability because it can actually be an asset. The investor or investors coming to your company who you're giving to an equity stake to can actually bring something to the table and add value to your company. Now the debt market's totally different because you're paying interest and you're doing it on a schedule. Yes. And you have a liability to make those payments on that schedule. And there's two ways of looking at it. There's debt within a company and debt that you take on personally. Now when you take on debt in a company, you're the director of the company and you borrow money and the business has the exposure. The company has the exposure to the debt, not you personally. So although it's still a liability, it's a different liability. Inside a company, when you take on debt, the company is a limited liability. Therefore, you as a person 
uh, do not have the exposure, the company does. Now when you take on debt, uh, personally, you're taking on the risk. You're signing up for the scheduled payments. And that is a liability that's different to when you do it through a company. Because if you don't stick to the payment schedule, then it means that you personally could end up insolvent, not a company, which is totally different. So, the, so even though debt is a liability in companies and uh, taking on personally, uh, it's a different type of liability. So for example, uh, mortgages. You know, that's the biggest liability somebody will ever take on in their life. But for the bank, that's an asset. Now, it was, it's obviously much more preferable uh, to buy that asset in cash because you could end up paying two and a half, three times more for the property uh, that you want to purchase, but you're doing it on a mortgage. You're taking a mortgage to purchase it. No wealthy people have liabilities. Wealthy people stick to the principle that they don't want to take on liabilities, they want to own assets. So it's obviously much more preferable to buy for cash. But people feel like they have no choice uh, but to borrow money in order to finance uh, a lifestyle that they can't afford right now for cash, but they pay over, let's say, 25 years. Um, but they do have an alternative, and that's what they don't realize. They can rent. Now, people think that renting is a liability, and they kind of group it in the same basket as debt. Well, it's not debt. It's not a liability in the traditional sense. Uh, if you rent, it can actually be an asset because you have no risk. You can walk out the next month, and you can, you can leave any time, and you have total freedom. And freedom is an asset, and that's what wealthy people get. They understand that. Um, people who don't really understand uh, money, they mix up assets and liabilities. And they think that taking on a mortgage and uh, having it secured on a home, that it's some sort of asset. It's not. It's a major, major liability. And what it essentially does is just put you uh, in a trap. And the owner of that debt uh, is receiving the payments and you're paying them and you you end up on this scheduled payment hamster wheel that is essentially a trap and you can't get out of it unless you pay it off so when you look at all uh, liabilities in debt in uh, for people individually not for companies it's all about mortgages credit cards, overdraft facilities, borrowing money to buy cars. You know, these are all the mistakes that people make. They don't think freedom is an asset and they sign themselves up and they get trapped. One of the biggest rules and biggest principles to stick to is to actually go ahead and buy everything for cash, if you can. Because the asset now is better to own than in the future. If you want to buy that asset, you should want to own it now and own it outright. So rent for 10 years, 10, 15 years, and even if the property price goes up, it doesn't matter. It means over, those, over that period, you haven't had a liability. You've actually had an asset over that period because you've had freedom. Sure. And then if you end up buying it at a higher price, it doesn't matter, you own it for cash, and you've had no liability in between. So this is absolutely essential. It's a principle that everybody should be sticking to. Otherwise, people get trapped and they end up on the hamster wheel. This infrastructure that uh, is built in the Western world where people borrow money to eventually own assets but have liabilities in between, this infrastructure isn't necessarily designed to benefit you. It's primarily designed to benefit the owners of the infrastructure. What you actually have to do is own your own infrastructure and have no liabilities. So if you have zero now, you have to stick to this principle and get to a point where you own infrastructure with no liabilities in between. How and do you do that? <laughs> how do you build your own infrastructure? Yeah. Okay, well, you listen, we're gonna get, yeah, we're gonna get in a cab now and head back up to the hotel before we go to, uh, before we go to the airport. If we jump in the cab now, I'll show you how to build your own infrastructure. Okay. So this infrastructure issue.
How does it work? So building your own infrastructure. Yeah. Um, okay, well this period we talked about earlier, yeah. between essentially going from zero to owning assets. Uh, that period we talked about, so having uh, no liabilities during that period, what you've actually got to do, and it might sound obvious, but what you actually have to do is save. Sure. And you have to build your asset base. Because during that period, uh, it's going to be very, very easy for you, for example, to go and take a job somewhere, uh, get a salary every month, and then start signing up for liabilities based on that salary. Um, so the best way to do things uh, is actually uh, build up your business. So work for yourself, build up a business. It can still be done if you're uh, working uh, for a business or a corporation, but it's more difficult. You've just got to live well within your means and you've got to have no liabilities. So liabilities like we talked about earlier with mortgages, uh, overdraft facilities, uh, credit cards, uh, taking loans to buy cars, stuff like this. You've got to have no liabilities and you've got to save. And you know, even if you have to rent, for example, or share an apartment for 10, 15 years, you've got to be prepared to do that and you've got to drop your pride. You know, setting up businesses, if that's the choice you're going to make, um, there's a million ways to make a million dollars. You know, you can start off uh, small and <clears throat> you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of dollars to start businesses off. Uh, most small businesses you can start off with nothing. So if that's something that you want to do, you know, that's the way you have to do it. You have to start small and build and build this asset base. Um, so during that entire period, going from zero up to owning assets, it's saving and having no liabilities. And in its entirety, what you're trying to do is essentially build your own infrastructure. So you're building your own pension. Now, if you look at the way the pensions industry works uh, in the Western world, so if you look at the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Europe, uh, what's become really apparent uh, in the last five to ten years is that uh, the generation previously who started on the pensions infrastructure in the 70s and over the throughout the 80s and 90s and noughties um, those people are not able to retire properly right. so if they can't do that it means the pensions question or the pensions solution uh, has not been met because the whole point of a pension is that it provides you income in retirement yeah. and these people can't retire sure. so pensions infrastructure has failed in the western world so <clears throat> whether that's the fault of the system or the fault of the people themselves uh, it's probably a mixture of the two um, but essentially the stats are uh, across the US Europe uh, U United Kingdom um, the annual national average salary uh, in each of those regions is basically equivalent to what an average person's pension value is when they retire. Which means if everybody retired today in the Western world, it would mean that they'd only be able to live in their current living standards for one year. And this is why everybody downgrades their lifestyle when they retire or rely on their children to pay for their retirement. <clears throat> That's not something you want to be doing. You know, if you want to be wealthy, you want to be building your own pension, not outsourcing it, but insourcing your pension. So learning how to do things properly. So the pensions infrastructure has failed. Um, another, <clears throat> another infrastructure, you know, that you have to be very, very careful of uh, is insurance. You know, insurance is a classic example where it's essentially a fear pitch. You know, insurance companies uh, create policies you know, this can be on anything, it can be on home insurance, car insurance, health insurance, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, it's just all numbers to the insurance company. Uh, they create the policies, you pay a premium for it, and they literally hire people, uh, like actuarial mathematicians, to build models to ensure that they 
never pay out. So, or if they pay out, it's a tiny percentage of overall uh, policies. So, insurance claims, for example, um, in the car industry, uh, the home insurance market, uh, medical insurance, these um, types of policies, the percentage that get paid out on per year, I mean, it's so small. I mean, we're looking at like two to four percent of policies per year. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the best way to create your own insurance, and it's again pretty obvious, is to build your own infrastructure so you become wealthy. So imagine, in, you know, why, why do you take an, an, an insurance policy, for, say, for accidents or health insurance? Because one day you might have an accident and people live in fear that one day they will. And then they have all these medical expenses that they have to pay. Um, so let's say, for example, in 15, 25 years, you're going to have an accident where you walk into the middle of the road and you get hit by a car and you're going to be in hospital for a month. Well, the, the only real way to insure yourself against that is to actually just become wealthy. So, you, so if you spend all that time knowing that that could be the case, it's lazy to go and pay for a premium that might, for a policy that may never actually pay out. So insurance is another infrastructure, as well as pensions that isn't necessarily built for your own benefit. Um, the other one is the whole uh, private debt market, which we keep going back to. So just think about, for example, uh, credit reports and the credit reports companies. Yeah. Just think how absurd this is. You get scored on your ability to borrow, and the higher your score, the more you can borrow. So the, so, so the, more, the, the higher you score, and the more compliant you are when yeah. it comes to liabilities, the bigger liabilities you can take on. That's your reward. That's your reward. <laughs> it's complete insanity. Sure. It's absurd. And <clears throat> if you want to start off on the road to success and build your asset base and build your own infrastructure, this, these are all the things that you have to avoid. You have to literally do the opposite of what everybody tells you to do. So going back to this point, um, understanding the function of money, respecting it, uh, having or being indifferent towards building money and becoming wealthy but wanting to do it because you understand how the system works and you don't necessarily uh, want to operate uh, within it you want to own it this is the way you have to go you have to build your asset but you have to build your asset base and in that period as you're building have no liabilities and it's difficult to begin with but it gets easier over time because the key to this when you're building assets is actually to generate passive income and cash flow you want to be making money while you sleep and it becomes exponential so it starts off difficult but it becomes progressively easier over the years and what's the old saying it takes 20 years to become an overnight success but you've just got to stick at it so build your infrastructure yourself build your own infrastructure it's the only way to go Take care, see you. We've got to get on the road now and um, we're heading to JFK and we'll land in Heathrow in the morning and yeah, we have to do it all over again. I'm obviously in Singapore uh, and I get to travel quite a lot with business and pleasure um, and for the last seven months uh, I've not been back to the United Kingdom and I've been traveling all the way through Asia, uh, Australia, through America and not one flight has been delayed or cancelled in the last seven months the first time. and then the first time I try to go back to the United Kingdom my flight is cancelled <laughs> and the next one's delayed it's crazy it's 
just typical of the United Kingdom. It's uh, it gives you a lot of perspective, yeah. you know, when you travel a lot. Um, you know, I'm traveling 20, 30 times a year. Um, it gives you gives you a lot of perspective on the country that you grew up in or live in. Uh, if you see what what else is outside, what else is available in the rest of the world. Okay, so I was just thinking earlier you said travel gives you perspective, right? Yeah. I mean what do you mean? What what have you found has changed for you? What's different for you now having okay. traveled the world? So you know obviously like we're talking about when you travel. Uh you get a perspective of other countries, economies and economic infrastructure and society. And when you build your own infrastructure, what happens is you, you, you get freedom. You get freedom of time. You get freedom to work on your own agenda. You get freedom of schedule. And for me, Freedom really is the most valuable asset you will actually ever have, you will ever own. So we talked about building your own infrastructure, uh, not having liabilities, and building assets. Well, freedom is actually the most valuable asset you will ever have. And building your own infrastructure gives you that. And traveling allows you to appreciate that. So I'm not talking about traveling like taking a vacation or a holiday for one or two weeks to like Mexico or Spain I'm talking about really traveling like going on the road and disappearing for a year or two traveling the world and seeing everything that the world has to offer because you don't really uh, appreciate freedom until you've got no plan and until you're working on your your traveling on your own schedule uh, you're traveling on your own time you're traveling on your own agenda and you don't have any perspective if you've never done that because you don't know what the world has to offer how do you know what you like how do you know what you really enjoy how do you know what you really want until you've seen what's on offer you don't have all the information and that's what traveling does for you it's uh, it's one of those things that also gives you uh, the freedom to choose the life that you want. And if you know what's out there, you can choose it. So, one of my regrets was that I didn't actually travel earlier in my life. And I think it's something that um, every kid should do. Every young person should do this as soon as they can because I traveled uh, in my late 20s and then I started to really appreciate what freedom really is and what the what perfect life I wanted to get for myself and that's the key because once you appreciate freedom and once you understand what your perfect life is the best thing you can actually do is then go back to where you're from and save and build and pay for cash the life that you want. Now that's really powerful because if you go and buy your perfect life somewhere in the world for cash, you've got your dream life already. And then you can go anywhere, back to the country where you're from to work, build businesses, keep building assets uh, in that country or all over the world. But if you don't like where you are, if you don't like what's happening at any moment in time in your country or where you are elsewhere, you own your dream life already. You can just get on a plane and leave. 
and there's no downside to life because you've got what you want already and traveling gives you that traveling as early as possible in your life makes you appreciate freedom working on your own schedule working on your own time agenda and also what's possible what you can actually go and own as your per your perfect dream life and once you understand that you go to work to get it and you know what's at the end of the road you know why you're doing it and it brings total clarity and that is why traveling is so important Um, 30 seconds into the United Kingdom and they've locked the doors to the terminal. Yeah, day's been going okay so far. Uh, got into London uh, this morning. <clears throat> We've um, I've been to a meeting and uh, got back to the hotel. Actually met up with my wife, who I haven't seen for a few weeks. And uh, we're gonna be heading out for dinner in a few hours. Um, so if you let me finish up here, um, give me an hour or two. I've just got a few things to do. We can, uh, we can sit down and have a proper chat. Sure. Great, thanks. Cool. Uh, so Anton, you've uh, made a career based on risk, essentially, managing risk. Um, how would you say young people should calculate which risks to take? Okay, well, I think with risk, um, what it comes down to is people tend to look at risk uh, incorrectly. So they, um, they look at risk in the two-dimensional traditional sense, which is to look at risk uh, where you say, okay, the more risk I take, uh, the more potential reward or loss I can have. So that's looking at it two dimensionally. The more risk I take, the more volatility I have, essentially. When in reality, in the real world, risk is actually subjective to your own personal situation. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take, for example, uh, a jobs scenario. So let's say, for example, you've got uh, a job where you're earning $50,000 a year and you believe that having that job is safe. There's no risk. But let's move on one step forward from that. Let's say, for example, you want to quit your job. So if you want to quit your job with no risk, you line up another job beforehand and you agree a higher salary with another employer and you move on to that other job by quitting your current job. So you line it up before. Um, but let's say we scrap that and just say, okay, well, what if I just quit my job? What's the likelihood of me ever earning uh, more than $50,000 a year in the future? Well, when you look at this and you calculate downside versus upside, it's pretty obvious. I mean, let's calculate the downside first. So 
what can you possibly earn that's less than 50,000? Well, you can earn 40,000 a year, 30,000 a year, 20,000 a year, zero. You know, your downside is 50,000. But the, the real downside in reality is very small. You know, it's very likely that you're going to earn somewhere around 50 or just less than that. So <clears throat> that's calculating the downside. But what about the upside? Well, your upside is actually all the money in the world. It's infinite. It's in infinite. So even if you have a very, very small percentage chance of earning infinity or all the money in the world, you're still earning more than 50,000. So your downside is very small and your upside is huge. Now, the person who takes the or has the $50,000 job to begin with tends to anchor themselves to that number. And then the next step is always to then, if you're anchoring yourself to that number, to take on liabilities that this number can pay for. And that to me is more risky. And that's why risk is subjective and not fully two-dimensional in the real world, because it's subjective to your own personal situation. So in that scenario, you feel like you're not taking risk, but you are because you're taking on lots of liabilities and therefore you actually can't assess risk objectively. And this is, this is the problem with risk in the real world is that most people can't look at it objectively. So when we looked at that jobs example, we very objectively calculated downside versus upside. But if you have all these liabilities, you can't. You can't look at it with clarity. So going back to this point that we've talked about before, uh, with freedom and freedom being the number one asset that you can possibly have freedom allows you to be objective when you're assessing risk because you will look at everything with clarity and look at everything with uh, very simple downside versus upside and the ideal situation to work towards is not having personal liabilities and assessing risk in terms of business by essentially trying to work towards um, business risk where you've got very limited downside but huge upside and getting yourself into that situation and repeating it an infinite amount of times so you can become wealthy. So. You know, for young people, in terms of what risks they should be taking or looking to take, um, the first thing to do is step outside yourself and assess your current situation. And if you have lots of liabilities, you need to work towards freedom. And if you work towards freedom, you're working towards a situation in which you can assess risk objectively. So step outside yourself and look at yourself objectively and work towards that situation and it's difficult to do but it's something that just has to be done <clears throat> otherwise you're going to always remain in a situation where you cannot assess risk objectively so step outside yourself and get the clarity work towards it and then try to position yourself in scenarios all the time where you have very limited downside and business risk but huge upside and for me that's the key so if you understand that risk is subjective you can then take the next step to working towards being objective and then getting yourself in that scenario calculating downside versus upside correctly and repeating it an infinite amount of times. If you do that well, you'll become wealthy. So tonight, uh, catching up with all the mentors, and Raj has actually flown in from the States. So he followed us a day later. So uh, we're gonna go and have a nice meal, have a few drinks, catch up on everything be interesting to hear what all the guys have got to say about all the students that are being mentored at the moment.
as we're always on the lookout for talent. Uh, so we're in uh, Mayfair, Barclay Square. And then there's a whole lot of Chris, what's your battery Yeah, come on, You don't know Chris? I'm just saying, those red shit is really hard. Really hard, okay, thank you. What do you think of the aesthetics? The aesthetics are fantastic. Oh, so bad. Yeah, it's been great. Had some great conversations with the mentors. And uh, I think we've got three new guys who we're going to bring into the Institute as uh, sponsored traders on POA. So we'll give them money and we'll seed them. It's great. Great. Uh, we're heading to Westminster University and on to another meeting. I've just got to pop in uh, to do the paperwork for Thursday's seminar. So it's quite funny, we're on uh, Park Lane now. So if you look at Park Lane, it's one of these uh, quite manicured streets in London. That's uh, one of those places where everybody wants to be because it's so beautiful next to Hyde Park, etc. Um, there's not many places like it in the UK, like it in London, but obviously like I'm living in Singapore now, every single street is like Park Lane. So it's quite funny when I come back, you know, you have this uh, perspective um, when you come from the outside back in, um, when we drive down this street, it kind of gives me that reminder and sense of what the UK is like for people that live here who don't get out of the country for sustained periods of time and see other countries, other cultures and, and how other societies operate. Okay, so uh, where have we just been? Uh, we've just been to Westminster University. Uh, finish up the paperwork for Thursday's seminar actually okay. and uh, we're gonna head to the city now have a quick meeting and then pop back to the hotel uh, get ready and go out for dinner so do we have time for a quick question yeah sure okay because I've just been thinking you know yesterday we were talking about risk how people calculate it wrong yeah and uh, it's just this running theme over the past it's a week or so we've been talking about people calculating things wrong making the wrong decisions when it comes to their money and their lives. Hmm. Why don't people know this stuff? Uh, well, really what it comes down to is the uh, traditional education system. You know, this stuff isn't taught in the traditional education system. And um, when you think about it, uh, in the education system, this question of how to make a success of yourself very clearly this isn't in the curriculum of the traditional education system and um, when you think about uh, teachers and school or university you know, look at the infrastructure that they are part of yeah. it's pretty obvious that uh, teachers during your entire childhood are really the spokesperson of the infrastructure that they're already part of. So they're obviously going to be protective of it. Mm. And they're going to champion the traditional education system. But the problem is, is that these people that are part of it, uh, they're always giving you the debilitating message, mm. which is not, or the opposite of the uh, principles or requirements to become successful. So you have to look at it objectively and it's very obvious that teachers themselves in the traditional education system have a conflict of interest with potentially your own objectives if you want to actually get freedom and success. You know, they're not, it's not part of the curriculum and the teachers are not going to teach you it 
because it's not part of the curriculum and they're protective of their own infrastructure. Now the, uh, the ultimate example of this, I guess, is uh, your parents. So your parents have always been part of the infrastructure. They came through the traditional education system and your parents are protective of you. You know, they, and because they're protective of you, uh, they're going to try and ensure that you do the right thing or what they think is the right thing. You know, so for example, uh, taking a job and it's safe. So what we were talking about earlier with risk, you know, your parents also have a conflict of interest and that conflict of interest is emotion. And with them being protective of you, that's driven by emotion. And additionally to this, so imagine you go uh, to get a new job or you go and get a business set up for yourself, a business infrastructure or even a business deal. When you go to your parents and ask them for their advice on what you think is the right financial decision or right career choice, what's, what's going to happen is your parents are going to well, probably default to the answer of, well, that looks risky or I wouldn't do this if I were you. You know, your parents at the end of the day are protective and they want to be proud of you, um, but they don't necessarily know what's actually good for you. You know, only you really know what's good for you. So for me, uh, it's two things uh, that it comes down to as to the reasons why people don't know this stuff. It's the traditional education system and your parents. And overall, that's conflict of interest. And um, what you've actually got to do is seek out alternative education and seek out mentors so successful people that do not have a conflict of interest. Now, if you can manage to do that, then you set yourself up in a situation where your education begins when you leave school or university. And that's what people have to remember. Really, your education doesn't start until you leave school or university, because that's the real world. And you have to seek out the alternative education, uh, say no, to your parents in terms of uh, financial advice and career advice. If, for example, your parents are not wealthy, they're cash flow poor, they're asset poor, they don't know what they're talking about. They're wrong. They've made all the wrong decisions themselves. So you, you have to seek out the alternative education. You have to seek out the mentors that don't have the conflict of interest. So for example, you know, if you go and work for a corporate and you're assigned a mentor, well, that person obviously still has a conflict of interest because as you come up through the company, you might end up becoming one of the people that challenges their job. Right. So there's obviously still a conflict of interest. So you have to look at things objectively and make sure when you're seeking out the alternative education and the mentors that there's no conflict of interest. And that's why people don't know this stuff because from childhood, all the infrastructure that's built around them uh, creates an environment where debilitating messages are provided consistently via conflict of interest. That's why people don't know it. So people have to just seek out the alternative education and seek out the mentors. Okay, so I just felt like um, we had to capture this. Like, I just wanted you to get this so I could show you something. Um, you know what we were talking about with the uh, traditional education system? Well, look what's happening here right now. This is the end result, okay? So all of these guys were on London Bridge, okay? They're all walking to London Bridge Station from the city. I think it's about 20, 20 past five right now. If you come in the morning, they're all walking the other way. Now, this is the end result. They've, they've all got the corporate job, 
they've got the monthly salary, they've probably all got liabilities every month. And essentially what they're doing in this labour market is they're working for nothing because at the end of every month their salary's coming in, net, they've got their liabilities, they pay out, what's left they spent. So essentially they're swapping their time for free. That's what, that's what they're doing. That's the end result of coming through the traditional system. And this is what they've got, you know, and I don't like seeing it. And, you know, it's, um, to me, it's just madness. It's crazy. You know, look at these guys. They're gonna be, they're probably all walking around with, with business cards, with their names written on them, with titles written under their names. So the corporates give them some sort of title. But essentially, when they put their card in the ATM at the end of the month, there's nothing. The most important business card is actually the one you put in the ATM. And you know, if you're a person that always thinks they're right for some reason, well, I would say this to you. Put your card in the ATM and see the number that looks back at you. That will tell you whether you're right or wrong or not. There's only one way to keep score. And uh, valuing your time is one of the most important things. If you're working in this type of situation, you know, from an outsider's perspective, coming in from other parts of the world and seeing this cold and objectively, I look at this and I know these people don't value their time because they don't get anything in return. Learn to value your time. That is a major, majorly important factor of going on the road to success. It absolutely amazes me every time I come here and see this. I'm baffled by what must be going on in their heads. How, they, how they've legitimized this to themselves. That working and giving their time away for nothing in return is essentially a positive thing for them. How is that good for them? How is that good for their families? So mate, where are we going? Uh, we're heading to uh, a drinks evening with the Institute Traders. So whenever I come back into London or go to New York or when I'm in Singapore, uh, we try to regularly get all the Institute traders of that region together. So tonight we're actually going to get all the Institute traders that are based in the UK together for a drink, have a big chat and everyone you know gets to meet up regularly. You know it's a community and uh, it's just great when all the guys know each other because they can bounce ideas off each other and they actually build you know, small networks and teams and really it's, uh, it's one big network globally. Piccadilly Circus, home of the tourist. Okay, so we'll start a tab. When it gets to two grand, let me know. <laughs> good to see you buddy, yeah, yeah good. good. Big, big man, here he is. Yeah. Oh, I love London. It's like New York, except it's more spread out. And people have worse teeth, but other than that, it's good. That's good idea. Singapore to New York to London. It's like how New York. Yeah, sick. We're filming so much fun stuff. So Tom's coming around. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. I think yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying, well, yeah, trying to do everything, but I'm just sticking to the US at the moment. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, until the bad housing start numbers and building back some of them. They almost had a double top now at 100. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was at that 100 point, I was like, should I take profits? And it's then, had like, the double top at 100. Yeah, yeah. With uh, over two earnings reports. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're at the pub with all the institutions. Two traders and uh, yeah these guys yeah we all get together these are all the guys that in the last one to two years have been through the program and they're all trading with their own money 
and uh, it's good to get all the guys together because it's all about leveraging the community intelligence you know once these guys are in the community and they're trading with their own money they need to get together and meet each other and that actually propels them on to bigger and better things one of the key reasons why we actually get together is also because one of the objectives is, of the Institute is to actually get uh, guys who are profitable in their accounts to come into the Institute infrastructure and trade for us. Um, two guys uh, here are up 50 and 60% in the last six months. So we're about to go and invite them on Power of Attorney to trade our money. It's really exciting. Let's do it. Let's do it. To the left. You're up 60% mate, since August. That's insane. And you've actually done it really well. You know, a lot of guys can take stupid exposure, make 60%, but it's a one-off. You'll be invited into one of our accounts, and I want you to trade some of our money. And you can charge a performance fee to us, 25% every quarter. So you're incentivized. See how you go for six months, and then we'll get bigger. Fine. Fancy that? That's fine, definitely. Mate, really you're in. <laughs> I want to have a challenge. All right, come over here. 50% in how long? Uh, six months. Okay. Six, nine months. And you've actually done it over many trades. You've done really well. Yeah, yeah. Like, you've been consistent. August, I want to invite you on Power of Attorney to trade some of my money. <laughs> I'm serious. Serious, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, we'll start off relatively small yeah, yeah. but we'll grow it as you make money okay okay so I've seen your numbers and we believe in you and I want you to trade for us okay you up for it oh yeah actually. you're part of the team probably now <laughs> thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. good man How you doing? <laughs> So I'm Jason McDonald. I'm uh, one of the uh, senior trading mentors, and basically this is a really good opportunity for us to meet a lot of the students in one place. And essentially, we run an open forum, so basically anybody can come up to us and ask us anything they like. Obviously, trading and stock market related, um, and we're basically here to just um, answer any questions that anybody would like to ask us. Um, hey, I'm uh, Gregor. Dupont. I'm a senior mentor. Uh, it's great to be here tonight with all the mentees, Anton, uh, uh, talking about the market, about what they want to do, uh, and talking to my mentees as well. Hey, how's it going? Good. I had a question. Okay. It's one that uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Okay. Because I think you get asked it a lot, actually. Okay. Can you guess what it is? No. Oh, okay, I, I, okay, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's it all about? This is essentially your visual catchphrase now. It's yeah. something that you've uh, become quite well known for. It holds 50 numbers, it can text, make and receive calls, uh -huh. and that's it. Sure. So what are your views on the alternative, which are smartphones? Well, this is exactly what I've been, this is exactly really what I've been talking about in terms of uh, valuing your time. So, you know, we had that discussion about valuing time sure. and how people don't value their time generally. Well, the smartphone is a perfect illustration of that. And I ditched my smartphone two and a half years ago. I used to have a BlackBerry. And uh, since I actually ditched the BlackBerry, uh, I've been the, the most efficient I've ever been in my career. So I get two, three hundred emails per day. Now, if I actually spent the time to go through every single one of those emails each day, I would actually never get anything done. And actually, 90% of those emails that I get per day mean absolutely nothing. They don't add any value to my life. Me even responding to them would actually waste the time of the person sending them to me. So there's absolutely no point 
in responding to them or even reading them to begin with. I know they're nonsense before I open them. So it's a complete waste of time. And you know, smartphones obviously have the email function, everybody has that. Um, I tend to schedule, because I get so many emails, I tend to schedule uh, 30 minutes every few days to, uh, to go through all of them. And um, that's all I need. You know, I probably get back to about 30 to 50 emails every couple of days. That's about it. Now, apart from the email function on smartphones, you've also got messaging systems. Now, these instant messaging systems with all these notifications, you know, combine that with emails. Uh, with a smartphone, my phone would literally be pinging during the working day every two or three minutes and it's just a huge distraction and think about what people do on these messaging systems most of the time they're just talking to people that they don't really know about nothing that adds any value to either person in that conversation right. so you know like I grew up in an era for example where if somebody say telephones you on your landline at home on a Monday you know, I'm talking like as a teenager or as a kid, sure. someone called you on a Monday and said, you know, do you fancy meeting up on Thursday? And I'd say, well, yeah, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll meet you on Thursday at midday uh, by the tree in the park. <laughs> and we would just meet there. There'd be nothing or no conversation in between. Right. These days, I mean, just to have a meeting, if we had the same conversation, there would be 25 messages in between sure. the initial conversation and actually meeting ab about nothing. Yeah. And it's just a waste of everybody's time. And you know, look at the way things go now, like in restaurants, you, you've seen it. Yeah. Everybody's seen it. The, the family or the group of people or even a couple on a yeah. date and everyone's just sitting there on their smartphones staring at their phones constantly during dinner. <clears throat> it's just totally unsocial as well. So it's not good in business and it's not good socially. Now, to highlight this in numbers terms, what's the real cost of having a smartphone? So let's say for example, you, uh, you value your time at $100 per hour and you spend an hour a day on your smartphone talking to a lot of people you don't really know or care about, about nonsense. What does that actually cost you per year? Well, 365 days a year, that's costing you $36,500. But what if you value your time at $1,000 an hour? It's 365 grand a year. That's the real cost of having a smartphone. But the causality works the other way around. So I'm not saying here, uh, when you get rich, ditch the smartphone. It works the other way around. You have to ditch the smartphone to begin with in order to value your time correctly and get rich. That comes later. And you know, something as well that you know, a lot of people ask me is uh, you know, if you're in the financial markets, how is it even possible for you to keep in touch with what's going on without having a smartphone? And I think that's the most ridiculous question ever. Because if you understand financial markets, <clears throat> you understand that everything that comes on your phone via mainstream media will never make you money in the financial markets. It's responsive to what's already happened in the past. Your job as a trader and a portfolio manager is to predict the future. It's, it's useless. So for me, and especially in my position in the financial markets, uh, you know, young people my advice would be literally go through cold turkey. Do what I did, ditch the smartphone, spend one or two months doing cold turkey. It'll feel really weird at the beginning because you'll pick up your phone and you won't be typing away. You'll only get SMS and telephone calls, but it will massively improve your life. You actually become so efficient. You can't even imagine how efficient you become. Your life changes really quick ditch the smartphone because you will always be inefficient with a smartphone.
brutal. <laughs> it is brutal, but yeah. you've just got to get rid of it. <clears throat> yeah. What What's your downside? Sure. Test it for one or two months and see what happens. Sure. And you'll and I promise you, your life will actually become better. Of course. We're going to head to a quick meeting in the city and then uh, we've got to head over to the seminar. So we've got to meet Jason before the seminar. And um, everything's already set up, so we just have to turn up really and deliver the seminar and then we've got drinks after. So, uh, Anton, you know we were talking about smartphones and how mm. financial news is by definition mm. reactionary. It's behind, it's too late, mm. and it's useless. Um, how do you feel about sort of news media in general? Does it have utility? Well, general or wider news media is really the same. Uh, in terms of utility as financial news media. Um, they're both pretty useless uh, if you want or if your objective is freedom and success. Because what you actually need to have, as we've discussed already, is uh, objectivity, clarity and independence of thought in order to put yourself on that road to freedom and success. And the wider news media um, is really uh, useless because it has an agenda and the agenda is the agenda itself so for example like uh, CCTV in China which is the state TV station or state sponsored TV station in China to me is exactly the same as the BBC in the UK okay. and Fox News in North America is exactly the same as North Korean state television. <laughs> they all have an agenda, and the agenda is the agenda itself. And the causality of objectivity on, on putting yourself on the road to success starts off with a recognition and understanding that this exists, and allowing yourself not to be brainwashed, and having independence of thought and clarity, so you could, so you can look at things in an objective manner. You, you basically don't allow yourself to be brainwashed. So, you know, all this media being pumped out every single day, uh, just because it's available, doesn't mean it's good for you. So, very similar to the uh, smartphone example with financial news media. Um, there's kind of no excuse today, because media can now be consumed in formats and bite-sized pieces that are personally tailored to your objectives. So newspapers, TV, uh, even online generalist media um, is 99% of it useless for you. And it's all about ratings. You know, for TV they want viewers, for advertising revenue. For newspapers they want readers, for advertising revenue. Online, they want clicks for advertising revenue. It's it's all, it's it's a business, and it's designed to make you keep coming back for more and more and more. And it's not necessarily good for you. What you've actually got to do is first recognise that, stay objective, and don't consume it. And and secondly, only consume what adds value to your own life and your objectives. And if your objective is freedom and success. It's value your time, don't waste your time consuming all of this stuff and don't even put yourself in front of it, don't even allow yourself to be exposed to it and consume what's good for you, what adds value to your objective and your life. And for young people, you know, this is a big lesson because it's so easy just to uh, consume all of this stuff and, and get sucked into the agenda. You've got to be uh, very disciplined not to expose yourself to it and consume what's good for you. So my advice to any young person who wants freedom, success, is to make sure they put themselves on that path.
So Anton, it's the last day. We're on our way to the London seminar. Yep. And um, I feel we've kind of come full circle actually because the question I'd like to ask you is about role models. Okay. And in Singapore, um, you talked about how there's a societal problem and young people have a lack of guidance, a lack of role models. Yeah. How should people choose their own? How should people uh, choose their own examples to follow? Well, I think you've hit on a point there, a good point. It is actually a massive problem in modern day society. And the problem is actually celebrity. So, you know, we were talking about mainstream media uh, earlier. Um, mainstream media in the modern age uh, glorifies celebrity. And these uh, so-called or self-proclaimed celebrity or celebrities uh, end up by default becoming young people's role models and <clears throat> modern celebrity is not famous for anything they're just famous for being celebrities they don't have anything concrete they don't have any track record background uh, they're essentially disposable commodities for the wider media agenda which is ratings and um, <clears throat> the you know, young people um, put these celebrities on a pedestal, they uh, glorify them, they want to be like them, and they become by default role models. Um, the problem is, is that these celebrities, for every one celebrity that actually has some sort of long lasting success, uh, there's another 9,899 celebrities uh, that or or people that never actually end up becoming a celebrity they all fail and there's another hundred that probably do get some sort of exposure or success uh, but then they're disposed of by the media they're essentially uh, entertainers and they get they get disposed of by the media outlet they get used and you know that isn't a role model you know so the, the one that actually makes it um they're still just mostly celebrities that are famous for just being a celebrity and um in terms of choosing role models you know that doesn't suit people's objectives or most people's objectives and what you've got to remember is is that they actually are just entertainers you know, they're essentially being paid by you in some way, usually through advertising, um, to entertain you. They're basically jesters or clowns. And um, tomorrow they'll be gone. You know, they'll be disposed of. And um, if you're looking for role models, the way you should pick them and the principle you should stick to is look for role models that are tangible and suit your objective. So, so, so role models that have uh, long lasting success and track record in what you want to do that suit your objective. And as long as you stick to that principle, you'll be fine. You know, if, if, you, if you aspire to be that, then you should be looking for role models and mentors that have actually achieved that and have long-lasting success and track record. And it, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, listen, just so you know, uh, I'm going to have to uh, call this uh, the end of the road. Uh, we're about to go into the seminar, and once I walk through those doors, it's, uh, it's all going to kick off. Like, I'll get surrounded. You know, London's really popular for the seminars because this is where we started. So, um, we'll be having drinks straight after the seminar and I'll be mobbed and uh, I'm going to have to leave after the bar and go straight to City Airport because I've got to go to Ibiza in the morning and I'm only going to get a few hours sleep. So, I really won't have a, an opportunity to talk anymore sure. and discuss things with you. Um, so we've been on the road for a couple of weeks. It's been great. I hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, I hope you know people watching this 
can actually you know take a lot away from it um, I've really enjoyed it I think we've had a, quite a lot of fun on the road and we've got a lot done you know this is what we do regularly at the Institute and this is you know regular week-to-week -week life in my world and I hope people can actually you know glean some information from this and we've helped people on the on the path in some way to freedom and success so uh, I'll have to say goodbye now if that's okay yeah, no problem cool it's been a pleasure Cheers. You well? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Neil. Neil. Hi. Edward. Edward. I'm going to go upstairs now. I'll see you upstairs. So listen, thanks for coming down. I know people have travelled quite far. This is Jason, who now runs the Institute in London. I'm now in Singapore. So I come back a couple of times a year now. We never hire anybody as a mentor uh, unless they've got a track record that's basically better than mine, or at least as good. So Jason's basically killed it in the markets on the hedge fund side and the bank side in the last 18 years. So this is what we're going to cover. Provide a safety net, um, but it's just in, in the same way that losses are a kind of function of trading. See me at the bottom.